This is the Bitcoin Made Simple Podcast. Here's your host, Corey Tusick. Hey everyone, today's guest has 99 Bitcoins, but an ETH ain't one. Uh, that I don't know if he actually has 99 Bitcoins, but uh, you know maybe he lost them all in a boating accident. Um, my guest today is Nate Martin. Nate is the host of 99 Bitcoins on uh, YouTube. If The channel is 99 Bitcoins, and then also there's 99bitcoins.com, uh, and he hosts uh, This Week in Crypto. Um, Nate's been doing that for four years now, I believe. Um, and, uh, he had an interesting story of, you know, how he got into it and, and how, you know, basically being the spokesperson for the channel has, you know, brought him into becoming a Bitcoin maximalist and, and obviously he knows a lot about it. So yeah, if you've gone on YouTube to look up anything about Bitcoin, you've likely seen, um, his channel because I think they've got like 500,000 subscribers now. So something crazy like that. Um, so anyways, I wanted to get him on because he's kind of one of the faces of Bitcoin. And I thought it was a great uh, a great person to get some information from and, and learn about how he got into this space and, and why he is a, a maximalist. So um, today's sponsor is CoinBeast. Do you have questions about Bitcoin? Personalize your learning and book a one-on-one -on -one video call with a Bitcoin pro on CoinBeast Connect. Learn about mining, security, the Lightning Network, DeFi, taxes, and many other topics. It's really easy. Choose your topic and pro, select the date when you're available, and bring your questions to the meeting room. Book your first call today by going to coinbeast.com and clicking on the Connect tab. Be prepared for the financial revolution and get the knowledge you need. Thanks again to Nate for coming on. If you want to follow him on Twitter, his Twitter handle is at NateMartin99B. And the website is 99bitcoins.com. Um, and if you want to reach out to me, the show Twitter handle is at Bitcoin Simply. My personal one is at Tusik Corey. And you can email the show Bitcoin Made Simple Podcast at gmail.com. Thanks. Yes, I'm like, gee. Oh, sorry. sorry no, it's all right. That? Uh, I've seen some of the names you've gotten on there, you know, Preston and Guy Swan. I'm like, geez, did I just make the 45 man roster in September? They just brought me up or what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The September call up. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. so I was like, I was kind of excited and this is great. And this is uh, believe it or not, the only, the second interview that uh, I've been asked to do. So, and one of and the first one wasn't even a, a Bitcoin related. Well, it was Bitcoin related. It was Todd uh, Newton and he wanted the, uh, kind of low down on Bitcoin and it was, it was, a, it was short, but sweet and just kind of training wheel stuff. But it was, it was fun. Yeah, no, no, no. That's, well, I, it's funny. I actually, I think I emailed your show probably back in like February. Okay. Um, and whatever email I found, maybe it was on the YouTube channel. Um, and so I don't know, it, you know, it was one of those things where I was like, this might've been an email that, you know, like you set up whenever you first were setting up the channel and it's like, you don't, it's not routed to wherever, you know, who knows. And I, I never take personal offense to, you know, it's like, you're just, you're pinging people all the time. I was saying to Preston, you know, you just, you ping people and if you don't hear back from them, it's whatever, you know? Um, right. And then, uh, and then I think we ended up being in a Twitter space together and I was like, Oh my God, I don't know why I didn't think to look on Twitter for him. Um, so yeah, so I found you on there and then uh I was like, I mean, you are one of the people that has to be. Yeah, you're not a September call up, you know, you're you're on the opening day roster. That's what's what's funny is that um I joined 99 Bitcoins about 3 years ago. It was it's not my baby. And a lot of people think that that's my channel and mm -hmm. it's not. Uh I came on you know my story, yeah, if if you're interested in hearing it is that yep. I actually it's it's less of a Bitcoin story than it was a Fiverr story because Ophir Bagel, who was actually uh the operator of 99 Bitcoins, uh he brought me on as a Fiverr spokesperson just to do some test runs of some of his videos. Oh, and, okay. and so um what's what's happened though is is to my fortune to be able to be exposed to Bitcoin pretty much as early as I was in such a fashion, because, you know, I pretty much went through a midlife crisis and bought all this video gear. And my wife is like, you know, you need to start making some money with this. And I said, okay. Yeah. Well, and so we'll kick ourselves up on the, on the fiber. And fortunately, 
Um, evidently, I had the look or the pace or whatever it was that people actually and the stood. voice too. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, that's just you know, you know, thank God for for what I've been given, so I can actually utilize it to to uh, to spread good information about good things. That's all. Yeah. That's that's all I can say. And so, yeah, I was in, so Ophir picked me up for a couple of his videos and, um, I, because I was reading the, the website on the teleprompter, literally, I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, why don't I just give this guy a call and maybe we can work together directly, which is not against the TOS of Fiverr. You know, if you do it through Fiverr, that's one thing, but you know, I have every right to make a, uh, a phone call or a, an email to, to whomever I can. And so we said, Hey, listen, they've made their money and they had, you know, Fiverr, Fiverr oh, put yeah. it together and they, they made their money. I said, why don't we just work direct? Because I'll just basically charge you less. You'll end up spending less and we'll both be the better for it. And, you know, for the last four years, we've been working together and it's been a great, great relationship. So he basically then produces the 99 Bitcoin stuff like he, it, or how, how does that work then? There is a team that actually collects and right now, what we do uh, more specifically than anything else uh, to maintain momentum is to do the weekly uh, news blasts that we do on uh, Monday mornings. And what happens is I get a script. I edit the script to make it sound more like me. I make sure that the stories are you know, up to snuff uh, at last minute when we actually mm-hmm. do them. And I'll take those and I'll read them. I'll green screen them out and then I'll set them off to the graphic artist. And the graphic artist will actually post them on Monday morning, I think it's 1 a.m. my time, something like that. So that's it's it's totally a team effort. Nick. So you know, yes, I have input, and I've written very few of the stories that that have been out there, but I have done some editing. I think the one thing that I had most of uh, the input on was the atomic swamps video. I actually that was my idea to put two of me on that video and mm. uh, t- tossing the baseball back and forth between myself. And that was, that was a lot of fun. And that one turned out pretty well. And it, it was, you know, it, it communicated what we wanted it to communicate while being a little bit of fun at the same time. Yeah, that's cool. So you, um, and now are you all Bitcoin, you know, are you 100% on your personal end or, you know, I mean, I know, uh, you know, cause everybody, you know, different levels, I mean, even, you know, sponsors for different people, you have to have, you know, you have to have the platforms that don't aren't just you know Bitcoin only and everything like that. But the, where are you, where do you land on that spectrum? Me personally, I'm Bitcoin only. I am a big I'm a Bitcoin maximalist um, because I've lost enough money and I've learned the lessons enough to the point where I'm like, what's what's the point? Because if Bitcoin and the other coins are all fighting for the same energy in order to create value, then why not just go, go to, to the best one? one. Yeah, just go to the best one. And, you know, when you take a look at the, 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 just how robust the network is just simply by how many nodes there are and how much energy is being put into um, mining and uh, maintaining the network, there's no question. It's just head and shoulders. There's there's no Mm -hmm. reason to consider really anything else. You know, I, and I, I thought about Litecoin for a while and it's like, okay, but if I'm, if, why is Litecoin necessary if Bitcoin's already there? Because you're going to put your value in one or the other. You might as well go with the one that's got the better network. And it's just, yeah, there's no question. Yeah, head and short. So in other words, you have, I've, I've been waiting to use this joke. You've got 99 Bitcoins, but a shit coin ain't, isn't one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you've been waiting for one. And you know, and what's funny is that that's actually the, 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 um, the premise behind 99 Bitcoins is I've got 99 Bitcoins, but a dollar ain't one was actually the original kind of tagline uh, that uh, Ophir was using. And so it's, it's funny that you kind of bring that up. Say I got 99 Bitcoins, but it shit, came, shit coin ain't one. Sure. We'll use that one too. Yeah. That, well, you that, know, the that, dollar that, is the original shit coin. So. Oh, well, yeah. Uh, that's, you know, don't get me started because, you know, we just, as we're recording this right now, we had just had the 50th anniversary of the 1971 Nixon shock. And, you know, that's the one thing about this, this Bitcoin mm-hmm. is that I went down the rabbit hole and, you know, I'm not ashamed to say it. I'm, I'm 54 years old. I got a couple of grandkids. So I'm, I'm in that just mid range between, you know, like I told you, whenever we were DMing, you said you were taking your grandkids. I said, I said, I, I honestly thought you were 40 tops. That's uh, lighting. So. That's totally lighting. I'm telling you. 
<laughs> yeah, you know, and that's yeah, you know, that's very kind. And, and yeah, you know, I've been told I look young for for my age, and, and I'll take that. I'll take it for as long as it's true, because you know, all I want to do is you know, basically stay in my basement and talk to a camera for a living. It's been great. I, I yeah. really enjoy that. Uh, so where was I? Um, oh yeah, so you were going to. So you're saying you know, going down the rabbit hole and you're on the older end. Oh my gosh, of- I have learned and have been motivated to learn more about money and economics over the last three years than I ever did through high school or college. And, and I, I was a business in, in the county major. So, you know, it, it's like, sure. Yeah. I'll learn about it. And I'll test it, you know, take the test and, and get the grade and get the diploma and, and go try and do your due. But I never realized until like right now, the, the value of the education and the history lessons necessary to really understand what we're digging into and the value of Bitcoin as sound money when compared to what we have been deceived by over the last 50 years. It's just, it, it, really, I've just been you know on my computer and my wife just recognizes now that I'm basically an economic student anymore. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I've, I would never picture myself doing these things, but I'm because I'm a film and you know media and all that kind of stuff. That's that's my business. That's what I do, and that's what I love to do. But uh, yeah, like on a Friday night, I was watching um, on YouTube like ec- uh, economic professor, um, you know, speeches, uh, you know, or uh, lectures, and I was like, "What in the world has happened to me? Like, this is where I am now." <laughs> you know, I've gone down this rabbit hole that far. Um, so you. So before you were doing 99 Bitcoins, you, what did you do before that? What were you, uh, you were accounting or? No, um, I was a high risk investment facilitator, okay. which is, which, which is the long version of, I was a, I was a blackjack dealer. I was a pit manager at a, at a casino. Oh, wow. And so my side gig was actually through Fiverr and doing spokesperson stuff. And I did some, you know, did some blogging for a while just to kind of ramp up in the video game. Uh, but basically the Fiverr turned 99 Bitcoins gig was a side gig on top of what I was working at the casino. And so what happened finally was there were, when we got to about a hundred thousand subscribers on 99 Bitcoins, it got to the point where I couldn't work on Fiverr for other cryptocurrency stuff. Actually that happened earlier. But it got to the point where I had to protect not only my brand, but 99 Bitcoin's brand as well. And taking a look at potential clients on Fiverr and micro gigging as a spokesperson, it got to the point where I just couldn't make any money anywhere else without worrying about tarnishing those brands. And so I said, oh, oh, fear, I think we got to do this as exclusive. So I'm not worried about that. And he said, that's fine. And, you know, he gave me enough of a stipend to the point where I didn't really need to work for the casino anymore. So now I get to be a spokesperson for 99 Bitcoins and to be a student of economics and be able to do it without worrying about whether or not I've got to, you know, scrape to eat my next meal. So it's, it's truly a blessing to be where I am when I am. It's really great. Yeah. That's awesome. And so your, uh, your Bitcoin discovery, what year was that, that, uh, I want to say 17. As a matter of fact, you know, yeah, I bought it 17,000 just uh, just before it crashed down to 3,000 after that. And what was funny is that I actually- Was that your first buy too? Uh, no, that wasn't my first buy. Uh, it was, that was the first bull run that I was, that I was buying into. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I kind of lament the fact now uh, that, uh, you know, the first time that I actually looked at Bitcoin's price when I started working with Ophir was, it was at 600 bucks. And I didn't know anything about Bitcoin. I was just literally just reading about the teleprompter at that point in time. And I'm like, eh, you know, maybe this, maybe that. And, you know, finally, when I got the gumption up to go ahead and make the investment, it was 12, 15, 17,000. And, you know, I felt like I was left holding a bag when it crashed down to $3,000 shortly after that in 2018. But, you know, held on. And, you know, I am where I am. And, you know, I'm not, you know, Bitcoin rich by any stretch of the imagination, but, you know, I'm hoping to be able to you know, utilize what I have to, to retire. That's the best I can hope for. Yeah. And to preserve your wealth and, you know, you mentioned your grandkids, all that kind of stuff. I mean, where do you see that as, is that kind of where you, you know, picture? Cause I mean, that's me is I'm not, it's not so much about myself. It's my kids and beyond, you know, uh, is that kind of the roadmap that you see for your yourself and in the Bitcoin journey is like, 
wow, I cannot just save for me, but this is going to change my family's life. Well, not only is it going to change the fa- my family's life, I actually, I kind of look broader than that. Um, my kids are, obviously my kids are grown and I've got two grandkids with, 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 uh, with one of them. But it's not really thinking about them except for the fact that I don't want to be, a, I didn't want to be a burden to them. And I got started late as, as far as saving and investing was concerned. So I'm behind the eight ball. And I take a look at Bitcoin and what it presents as a store of value and as really the hope for anybody that was in my position. And there are plenty of us. I mean, let's be honest. There are 45, 50, 55 year olds that are going, I'm, I'm never going to be able to retire. And the reason for that is not only because of some bad decisions or just not being well-informed through whatever path of life they've had, but because we've had this money that you have to spend it in order for it to be of the same value as when you earned it. Because if you don't, well, then it's not going to be of the same value. That's what inflation is. And so we've been fooled over these last 50 years. And now we have a money to where that value is going to either stay put or it's going to get higher because there is a finite amount of it. And when I finally kind of grasped that and recognized that that's what sound money is and there's nobody that can just inflate it out of, out of value, I went, I'm all in. I'm totally all in. Everything from my 401ks, from my you know, uh, previous employers to you know, what I'm investing in now, uh, there just doesn't seem to be anything else that's going to either hold value or increase in value or even be as profitable as what Bitcoin is now. I mean, I take a look at I took a look at the, the stock market and I asked myself, if they're measuring the stock market in dollars, then are they really representing the value of the stock market properly? I mean, can they? Yeah. Because you know, when you're when you're talking about fiat being the measurement for anything, you're talking about something, you're talking about a measuring stick where the inch marks are moving. And they keep moving closer and closer and closer to each other. And you can't keep a measurement that way. It has to be standard or it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's basically, it sounds like this story that I had where I basically, yeah, I, once I figured it out, um, which by the way, you know, like I always say this to the listeners, figuring it out does not mean you understand the cryptography and everything down to the, you know, nth degree. It's just, if you get that like surface level, big picture, like, Oh, this is hard money. It can't be changed. And everything else in the world is not hard money. Then, you know, I mean, that's the game changer for me. Right. Right. And you know, it's, you just brought something to mind. I was having a a conversation on one of the spaces, either clubhouse or Twitter spaces. I kind of switch between the two, depending on the conversations that are going on. And they were talking about the difference between Ethereum and Bitcoin. And yeah, I, you know, initially I was looking into Ethereum, but then I recognized one, the, the, um, the total number of ether that's going to be out there. Nobody knows. Does anybody know because nobody's ever answered that question. How many ether are there? Is there a limit? Is it unlimited? How does that work? And it's, it's like we're, there's there's more spin there than there is on a merry-go-round on a Saturday afternoon. Yeah. So so That's knowing that Bitcoin's <laughs> knowing that Bitcoin's only going to be twenty one million, and no, I mean take I take a look at what a person like me learns, and the the fact is that we have so over teched the market that people in in my demographic first of all we got to learn what bitcoin is okay and we need to learn how to spend it and how to save it and how to store it you start talking about all these other platforms and it's like okay i can learn how to drive a car that's fine i don't need to learn how to change the spark plugs or or change the you know anything under the hood or in the suspension i don't need to know any of that stuff i just need to know basic maintenance and how to drive the car Okay. That's, Mm -hmm. that's Bitcoin. You try to put me in a jet plane and tell me, and tell me how to fly in, then that's, that's Ethereum. There's no freaking way that, that somebody my age, my demographic that of, of what we know is going to get in that jet, jet plane and be able to utilize it to its potential because it's too advanced. It's too complicated. It's too technical. Dude, make digital money, make it finite, make it so I can use it. That's it. After that, 
I don't care yet because we haven't even gotten the market to recognize that. I mean, we're, I mean, I'm sure you and I both have talked to our friends and said, you know, you don't need to buy a whole Bitcoin. We're still yeah. there. Oh yeah. They think it's too expensive. You know, it's, uh, it's, I mean, I've been telling my 14 year old nephew, you know, uh, be like, uh, like, you know, I mean, he's starting to earn a little bit of money here and there. Like, trust me, you're going to want to put some, put some in Bitcoin. And he's like, it's too expensive. I was like, Dude, I actually he start. I think I think he might start listening to the podcast. Uh, so if you know if he's gonna listen to his uh, old uncle, he'll uh, he'll uh, maybe he's come a long way. But yeah, he was like, "What do you mean you can't buy a whole one?" And I was like, "For a fourteen year old, you know, like the narrative, you know, like you said, it does get like super technical, you know. Mm-hmm. Like we can you can go down that like you know uh, all the I think in the one Twitter space I was trying to join in. I didn't get in. On, I think you were in it and then. Uh, but I joined in later um, and uh, last night we were talking about, you know, storage and I was like, somebody said it, they were like, most people are going to hold their stuff on exchanges, you know, like in the future, you know, it, yes, you should hold your own keys. And so if you're listening to this, you're an early adopter, that means, you know, get your, get your own keys and, and cold storage and everything. But like when it becomes the monetary future, you know, I mean, maybe it's through strike, you know, or something like that on the lightning network. Like it's, it's going to be like people's bank accounts, you know, I mean, they, they don't actually hold their money. They just look at it. They log in online and go, Oh good. It's still there. You know? And then they, the number hasn't changed. So. I, I sort of see Bitcoin storage or utilization in three layers. Uh, and two of them are obvious because you have, um, although these are not the layers I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the blockchain itself and then lightning on top of it as a layer two. What I'm talking about is equating it with how you deal with money now, because you have your wallet that you've got cash in. Okay. And if it drops out of your pocket, it's gone, but you have the ease of use in how quickly you can actually transact with it at a moment's notice. That's the lightning network. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now you have your checking account or a money market account. And that is what you might have on chain. Okay. Um, maybe that's in an exchange or maybe that's on a, a, a hot wallet that you've got on your phone, like Exodus or like Blue Wallet or what have you. Uh, and yeah, it costs more to transact, but you know that it's that you have your own keys. On Lightning, that's different. You don't have your own keys. You have your own keys on a hot wallet. And then the third layer is the vault. And that is your cold storage, where your private key is not easily accessible by use. You can't really just spend money out of it um, at a coffee shop or for a car or what have you. You have to actually take effort and go open the vault, which is you know plugging in your uh, hardware wallet or going and cracking open the uh, the seed phrase so that you can actually access that. That's your vault, and and that's sort of the way I look at Bitcoin. It it, it really does equate to how much. You want access to it, whether it's your access or a bad actor's access. It really is exactly the same as what it is with any money. It's like you got easy access in your wallet. You've got a checking account or money market account where you have control over it. Although obviously you have more control over your Bitcoin because nobody, no bank account can, no bank can actually take that money. Confiscate it or yeah. Right, confiscate it. Uh, Words are hard uh, and I speak for a living. So there you go. <laughs> and, uh, and then you've got the vault, which is where you hide your money. That's for, that's for another time. That's digging the hole and put in the ground so that you have it for a later time. So that's, that's sort of where I see the three layers of access for Bitcoin equating to how people use money now. And the more that we're able to uh, show people that Bitcoin is money no different than how they're using money now, with the exception of the fact that that money, if you save it, is still going to at least be worth as much when you spend it as when it as what it was when you earned it that's the important point yeah um you know i just saw uh on twitter busta rhymes uh post and said you know i ask a simple question if to any artist if you were given ten thousand dollars in cash or ten thousand dollars in bitcoin what would you rather have and uh and i thought like oh he should follow that up with saying and you can't spend each other, each either one for five years. What would you rather have? Because that's that's really the litmus test, you know. Like people, they don't see the volatility in the dollar until you go like, okay, yeah, put it in your savings account for ten years, and you know, see see what that gets you. You know, I mean, like we have 
you know, uh, cars and stuff like that. You look at the, what the price of a new car is. It's just, it's crazy. It is nuts. You know, no. $10,000, <laughs> 10 years ago is not going to buy the same amount of car as it would now. No. And that's, that's, that's the thing too, is it, you know, you, you want to start talking about inflation with somebody and make them understand it. Here's how you do it. If two years ago, if I worked for $20 an hour for you and I worked for an hour. Okay. And you offered me either 20 bucks or 10 gallons of gas. Okay. That the work that I did is worth 10 gallons of gas. Well, what if I save that $20, put it in my pocket for, for, for two years. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, now I need gas. Okay. So I go to get gas. I should expect the value that I earned, which was 10 gallons, but I can't because that store value, that $20 bill, that only, that only buys six gallons of gas anymore. So what did I really work for? Did I work for 10 gallons of gas or did I work for six? You got to ask yourself that question. What do you, and the thing is, you talk about those, those rappers and, and a lot of, yeah, I shouldn't say celebrities. That's, that's, that's kind of stereotyping, but m- many people, if not most in first world society, they spend their money fast. Oh you know, yeah, They spend their money fast. Uh, savings is almost totally foreign to them and because like, I, you know, just like the $20 example, because it's not going to be worth the same amount. You can't go, um, you know what? I really liked, I really like that set of knives, but I'm going to wait to buy it until I actually need it. Well, you might as well get them now because you're not going to be able to buy it with the same 50 bucks, you know, six months down the road as you can get it now. And that's yeah. where our credit problems come in too. Which is basically what they want at this point. They want you, you know, to, to go down the, the Chinese social credit score and the, the, you know, digital one with, you know, uh, where it has an expiration date and you're not oh, allowed to save. Oh, wow. Yeah. I don't, yeah. Don't even get me started. If you have money with an expiration date, which you basically do now anyway, it's just that it expires over time instead of immediately. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's not a hard date. They just said, Oh, it'll, you know, slowly, slowly become obsolete. Exactly. Well, not just, it's just, it's rotting in your pocket is what it's doing. So you might as well just use it now. And unfortunately, it's caused a, a credit crisis that, you know, that you just can't, you can't control anymore. I mean, you can kick the can down the road until you run out of road. If we're getting to the point of running out of road. Yeah. And then, well, and then what happens? I think that's, you know, I, I was just listening to um, the great rip with a uh, laser hodl uh, talking with Marty Bent about, you know, the great reset and, and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, the, the 2030 and, you know, it's like really overwhelming whenever you get into it. But, um, but I think Bitcoin is here to save us from that. What do you think? I think that Bitcoin is the best version of sound money that we have available to us. Thank God it was invented. Okay. And Oh my word, it was invented by somebody that doesn't want the notoriety or the, or, or the credit. And that little uniqueness is crazy genius because otherwise you got somebody to blame for governments to just kind of go after and then try to just crush it. Can't so call Satoshi to the hill. Exactly. Exactly. And so we have a sound money that is better than anything we've ever had before. Obviously, it used to be gold, and we've all had these conversations before. But if there's somebody that's new to listening to a podcast or a video that doesn't understand sound money, when you have money that can't be inflated, meaning that they just can't keep printing money over and over again without any work being done to actually create it, um, when you have a money that is sound, that requires work to acquire it, then you have something that's that's going to hold its value over a period of time. We have never seen that. I mean, I'm, you know, how old I am. I'm 54 years old. It was 1971. I have never lived through or learned about a sound money system. Mm -hmm. We talk about boomers all the time and they don't know anything. Yeah. They're kind of losing their edge, but here's the thing. They used to know how sound money worked and what decisions to make when it did. Yeah. They used to. And it, it's, I mean, it's crazy to think that like the dollar hasn't been pegged. I said this, I'll probably said this, you know, many podcasts ago, but like I literally up until a handful of years ago thought that if Fort Knox got raided and they found 
that we didn't that the rest of the world found out that like our we didn't have enough gold to cover all the all the dollars that it would be a national crisis you know like and i was like well the whole world would implode and, and the u.s would would lose its power and then i found out that we basically in 1971 said that and we're like yeah we we can't so uh you know we're going to temporarily temporarily for 50 years uh you know suspend the gold standard and um and basically confiscated everybody's gold um and and then they you know figured out this this money printing you know uh man, manipulation of the markets and uh that's that's brought us to where we are today and i you know i i, I agree with you where it's like if it wasn't for bitcoin where would we be mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, what do you think would be we'd be looking at right now? It'd be pretty bleak in my eyes. I think that we would be looking at a much higher gold price, first of all, uh, and other um, uh, precious minerals. I think that we might be looking at a lot more of that because without Bitcoin, the general thought process would be, well, I got to put my money into gold and silver because that's a hedge against inflation. Well, that used to be the case. Now there's a better product because that better product is much easier more easily storable because you really don't even need anything to store your value. You can just have those 12 to 24 words in your head and travel anywhere you want to with all of the value that you've amassed in your in your mind. So you don't have to worry about transporting gold anymore or trusting somebody to store your gold and giving you a piece of paper that says, I owe you this much gold. Well, the United States owed this much gold. And guess what happened in 1971? They said, nah, we're not going to give it back. I don't want to take that. I don't want to take that chance. So when you have something that is easily storable because you really don't need anything, and if you do have something, it's as simple as a hardware wallet that fits on your keychain. Uh, and it's also transferable over space, meaning you can literally digitally transfer your wealth to another person's possession in the blink of an eye. You know, whether that be on the Lightning Network or whether that be on chain, gold can't hold a candle to that because yep. a, phys- a physical thing that has to be transported has two, you know, gold had two things that, that had against it as far as nation to nation was concerned. First, you had to deal with piracy. And secondly, you had to deal with storms. You weren't going to get your payment if the boat didn't make it. You yeah. know, how many, how, how many gold and silver bars are still at the bottom of the ocean? Yeah. Because that was a payment for something. Hence why all the Bitcoiners have so many boating accidents. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's tons of Bitcoin at the bottom of the ocean right now. Oh. And uh, it'll be there forever, you know. It'll be there forever. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, we're right now we're in this situation where we see, what do you think of the, you know, a little bit of the current topics, you know, like that we have China banning um mining we have the u.s coming out with this infrastructure bill that might make mining a mess in uh in the united states um do you think that they're really trying to clamp down because i mean my, i have my personal opinion but i mean i like to i like to form mine based off of others and and you know get as much information as i can um so where do you what do you think is happening right now i am very careful about trying to prognosticate because I don't, I don't like to do it because there are so many variables that are involved Mm -hmm. and I'll expose the variables that I don't think are being talked about uh, Mm -hmm. enough. And then I'll let you kind of make your own conclusion from that. But here's the thing, talking about spending first and then paying it back later, which is what we've all kind of learned how to do because the dollar, it's going to be easier to pay back weak dollars than it was, you know, borrowing the money because, making 10,000, you know, buying a house, you know, everybody wants to buy a house, make that mortgage payment over to 15 to 30 years, because they assume that they're going to be making more money over time by their three and 4% raises over that period of time through their career. It's going to be easier to make those payments. And you're going to have more disposable income as that occurs because you're making a mortgage payment and it's less and less of your actual, the income that you're making. Well, the U S has the same issue. Everybody who has debt has the same issue. And if the United States government has the power to either strengthen or weaken the U.S. dollar, and they owe 28 trillion of them, do you think that they want to pay back strong dollars or weak dollars? 
a good point. They're not going to strengthen the dollar. And basically, they're going to just keep making the situation worse <laughs> and more difficult and, uh, and painful. Um, do you subscribe to the, you know, theory that, that, uh, we're in this great reset and, and that's what a lot of the economic hardships have basically been, been about, uh, you know, uh, the elites kind of controlling, um, manipulating the markets and, and pushing, uh, you know, robbing from the rich. Cause I mean, if you look at the WTF happened in 1971.com, you know, the wealth gap, everything since we went off the gold standard has completely changed. What do you see there? I think that the wealth, well, I'm, I'm going to kind of push back on that because I think that the wealth gap has not been a construct of the money as much as it's been a construct of legislation, keeping the smaller to middle income person or family from being able to start and operate a business without absolutely drowning them in regulation. That's been a huge issue in the United States because you take a look at how corporate tax rates have been structured. You take a look at how many regulations a small businessman has to deal with or, or businesswoman uh, has to deal with in just trying to start and operate a business. And it makes it difficult, more difficult for upward mobility, which is exactly what, the, what freedom is supposed to be about. If you mm-hmm. can do the work, provide a good or service that people want and transact freely for it, then you're going to become more wealthy and be able to do with that wealth what you will, whether that be for charity, whether that be to build other businesses, that's supposed to be totally up to you. So I think that the wealth gap is more uh, more about legislating a wall between the elites and the common, for lack of a better term, uh, than it is about the actual what the money is. So that's, that's where I'm going to go with that. Um, no, you had a second part to your question. I hope I answered the first one. Um, let me see if I can remember the second part. Cause I tend to, uh, I've, I've gone a little off script here, so I'm looking at my I'm notes. And, <laughs> <laughs> well, I tend to, I write down my questions and then, um, and then while we're going, I just start running along. But, uh, but do you think, you know, I mean, do you think that, so, to expand upon what you were saying with uh, legislation becoming the problem and that expanding the wealth gap, I think that's something that's interesting to look at because we do like to blame everything on money um, and the monetary, oh, I guess, legislations and the monetary policy. But I, I agree with you, you know, being a business owner, like <laughs> it's such a headache to open a business, you know, like how many hoops you have to jump through just to, to run a business. You can't even have a kid running a lemonade stand on the corner anymore without having a cop stop and say, you know, you can't do that because you don't have a permit to sell, you know, beverages. Yeah. I mean, there are places like that. I've read them in the news. and Are you kidding me? Can you just let a kid make some lemonade and, and, and throw a few cents in the bank and feel like they did something? Oh, yeah. And like, I guess you would agree with, I don't know if you ever watched Parks and Recreation, but I'm a fan of Ron Swanson uh, from Parks and Recreation. And he, uh, they were doing like a cookout in a park and this ranger came up to him and said, do you have a permit for that? And he said, Oh yes, I do right here. And he pulled out a piece of paper and handed it to him. And on the inside of the piece of paper, it was just his handwriting. And it said, I can do what I want. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, that's uh, that's my idea of a permit. Cause it's uh, yeah, we've, you know, just regulated ourselves into a corner. And I mean, that's what I think is going to happen with, Unfortunately, with mining, I think, you know, mining and a lot of the you know, innovation that can happen around um, around uh, Bitcoin in the United States is now going to get stuck in this mud of the infrastructure bill. Um, I don't see that happening uh, specifically in Texas and Wyoming. Uh, just hearing what some of the people that are actually in the legislatures have to say uh, about the fact that, you know, one part good part about the Constitution is that a state legislature can go. Uh, that federal law, yeah, we're not going to go by that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, obviously I'm w- way oversimplifying how that works, but uh, there there are states and there are legislatures 
uh, around the country. And obviously, you know, you and I we live in the United States, so this is what we know uh, that are going, no, this is too much overreach by the federal government. And that's not what the federal government was intended to do. It was intended to make it so that the states could interact with one another without the federal government really being a middleman. And not a lot of people actually recognize that. Yeah. So I assume uh, then you're on my side with the, you know, it should be more of a republic of uh, the United States. You know, it's people say like, oh, it's a democracy. And I'm like, well, no, democracy leads to mob rule. Um, And, you know, it is a republic. It is a collection of states. And I love the fact that, you know, like I live in Pennsylvania, but I've been saying, you know, Pennsylvania, the ball is in your court with all this stuff that's going on. Like you want me to stay, then, you know, like you better keep it a free and open state if you want me to leave, um, you know, and there's that balkanization of people, you know, leaving in mass to go to Texas and Florida and. Yeah, because you know. uh, uh, California lost how many seats, three seats? I think New York lost two seats in the last census. Texas picked up three electoral votes and meaning that they picked up three additional uh, Congress people mm-hmm. because of the census, which tell and I think Florida picked up two, if I'm not mistaken, I'm, I may be missing up the numbers, but I know that Florida and Texas picked up seats in California, New York lost seats uh, in Congress because of the, the exodus of, of, of residents going to the other States. And that that's going to make a difference in uh, the election cycles that are coming up. What do you think about, uh, you know, all the, you know, I don't know if you've uh, been in uh, spaces with Lord Fusatua um, and uh, from Tonga, but he said before in spaces, he said he's been in, you know, like meetings at the highest level in Beijing and uh, they, you know, without unequivocally have said, the 1800s was Great Britain's, the 1900s was the United States, and um, the 2000s are going to be theirs. And so, you know, they're obviously trying to exert their dominance. Um, but I think it's fascinating that you have this thing called the United States that um, is very, it, for as, as bad as things have gotten, there are parts of it where they're like, nope, I'm not moving. I'm not doing anything. Like, we're not changing we're freedom. Um, you know, what do you, what do you think about that? Do you think we're going to see people keep moving towards free, you know, and I'm, you don't have to dox yourself, but I mean, if you're in a free and open area, you know, I mean, are you going to stay there? Are you, or if you're locked down, are you going to leave? We've talked about, uh, moving. Sure. We have. Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, I, I live in, a part of Michigan that's not near Detroit. So we're, you know, it's sort of like living in Southern Illinois. You're, you're kind of, uh, you're kind of bound by the population that isn't near you as far as elections are concerned. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I'll say this, um, a lot of money from, from Michigan has driven down to Indiana as far as the lockdowns are concerned. That's kind of an aside. Uh, but the thing is this, the answer is yes, I would absolutely be willing to move and I'd be willing to move out of the country if necessary to try to maintain the rights that God gave me, which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which by the way, originally was supposed to be written, <laughs> the yeah. pursuit of property. That's a whole nother cup of coffee. Uh, but you well, know, go ahead and get into that if you want. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. The thing is though, is that um, if you want me to get into that digression, I'll be happy to get into that digression. Uh, cause here's the, th- here is the crux of how men should behave with other men. If it is true that we have natural rights, and if it is true that I have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, I also must recognize that you also have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so we must transact socially and economically in such a fashion as to protect our own while respecting the others. Yeah. That's a, you know, in this selfish world we live in nowadays, that's a good way to frame it. You know, if you're getting that, that means that you have to also offer that to others. Yeah, because that's that's how society is intended 
or, or it, that's how it is necessary to work. Because if you can't understand that the rights that you have are also endowed to the person that's in front of you that you're trying to transact either socially or economically with, uh, then you're missing the point. The, and that's how community actually, uh, that's how a civil society can actually function. Because without that respect, one, to, one with the other of those rights, which no man has to take those rights away from another man, uh, then, then society will crumble. Trying to search for some sort of moral um, standard, which always changes when men try to affect it, because my idea of right is going to be different than your idea of right. And you and I, I think, agree on a lot of things. There's going to be some things that we disagree on. Yeah. You know? But there's, there's got to be the understanding that, you know, if we can start with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and we need to respect the other's right as well as defending my own, uh, let's start there. And then there will be much more respect and civil liberties, actually, uh, when we begin with just two people being able to interact in that fashion. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, so w- let's pull on the, the thread of the life liberty in the pursuit of property okay um because i as much as i like to pride myself on knowing my history i did not know that that's how it was supposed to be originally written um so what's the what's the the story behind that uh that was in jefferson's original draft and i and i don't know why that was taken out i haven't really dug enough into that so i'm i'm not going to delve into something about which i find i i think myself a bit ignorant but i i do know that one of the drafts it was life liberty in the pursuit of property and you know for those of, for those of you who even remember any of the 10 commandments you know it was you know if you talk about life that's do not murder you talk about liberty well, let's talk about property. Well, that's do not steal. Okay. Well, mm-hmm. if God put in the Ten Commandments, do not steal, well, then he intended there to be property rights. Yeah. Because he you is. can't steal something that doesn't belong to anybody. It's true. And if you have, um, you know, do not steal, uh, then you think about the the sins of a nation, you know. Um, oh, absolutely. You know, with how much... They've stolen not just from other nations, but from from their populace, um, you know, and, and how much they the, the time theft that we've seen, you know, with people losing their purchasing power over years and everything getting inflate, inflated away. Uh, it's it's kind of crazy. I, I would say not that they were this in tune with what the wokeness of today was going to be, but um, but, you know, it's a lot easier to loosely define what happiness is than property (laughs) so you know that's very true you know not that they not that they did that on purpose but boy that played right into the hands of like my feelings you know like you're hurting my feelings and it's like you know like (laughs) you know you're you're supposed to you know it's okay to have feelings about things you know it's kind of like i i I was saying in a space the one night i was like you know people think that like we live in this world where you're not supposed to ever have anything bad happen to you or like you're never supposed to be sad and it's like but no like if you feel like your your emotions are supposed to go up and down that's natural you know like they're supposed to be good and bad things that happen through life and it's about managing your emotions and and going with the ebbs and the flows um but yeah like we live in this world where it's like you know everybody gets a participation trophy and you know we can't have anybody's feelings hurt I forget if I told this story on the podcast before or not, but like uh, <laughs> the, the T-ball for my, I was coaching my son's T-ball team. I don't know if you did all that back in the day, but, uh, but the, um, I played I Cub Scout softball. I never had a T that I hit the ball off of. Oh, nice. Um, so the, we had, I don't know if this is a newer thing. I don't remember this as a kid, but um you know, we'd play the games and our kids would get out, but like the kid would stay on base, you know? And, uh, I was like, okay, I mean, it's fine. You know, you don't want kids to get upset and have to go to the bench, whatever. Um, and I'm also thinking, well, they're learning. So like, as the season progresses, we will start implementing outs. Um, and then, uh, so we had just started implementing outs and I'll admit my team was good. Um, I mean, I'm, we're not like, you know, I'm not like, I was all about fun, but these kids like loved getting 
to hit the ball. They loved playing together, and it, it was just such a fun team that we there had this spring. Of, is there are groups of kids that are just going to have more talent than there than other groups of kids, and you can't just ascribe equal talent to every team. You can't do that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, so, so then we had um, we had this game where uh, we were. It, it started. It was looked like it was about to start raining. And then all of a sudden, right before the game started, it just started pouring. Um, now the fields that we play on are like the nice, like the the rubber pellet fields, you know, that like it drains instantly. So as long as the rain stops, you can play the game. Mm-hmm. Um, and we looked, and it was like it was going to take like fifteen minutes for the rain to come through. And I went over to the before the game, I'd gone over to the other team's coach, and I said, "Hey, do you want to play outs tonight?" And he was like, him and Han, like, uh, I don't know, you know, I don't know, you know, like, well, we don't really want to do that. You know, don't want the kids to be like upset. And I was like, I mean, they got to learn, you know, when they get to coach pitch, they're going to get out and then they're going to stand on first base and the coach is going to be like, you have to go to the bench. And they're going to be like, what do you mean? I was like, so they have to learn. Like you sometimes do not win in life. And, um, and so anyway, so it starts raining and he comes over to me after a couple minutes and he goes, what are you thinking? Do you think we should cancel? And I was like, no, I looked at the weather and it's going to be clear in like 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Some of the parents are, you know, but you know, okay. So he walks over to his bench, comes back five minutes later. And he says to me, so what are you thinking? And I was like the same thing I was thinking five minutes ago. And, um, (laughs) and he's like, okay. And he walked back to his bench. I'm just standing there looking at my, like talking to my son. And next thing I know, I see kids in their jerseys, like running behind our bench towards the parking lot. And like, he literally just like bailed. He like told his team, like, we're just leaving. And they locked up and everything. (laughs) So I didn't say this to the kids, but I said to the other dads and moms that were coaching with me, I said, they're afraid of us. And I was like, I'm just kidding. They're not really afraid of us. I was like, but I was going to let this guy slide on doing outs with our kids. Like, but I was like, when we play this makeup game, we're going to kick their ass. I was like, we are going to, (laughs) we are going to get all of their players out. Um, so, I mean, you know, we didn't actually say that to the kids and don't, if you're triggered by this words, yeah, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. If you're triggered by this, don't worry. You know, we weren't mean or anything, but we did get our kids extra route up for that game. And there was a point, you know, where like, think about it. And usually in their games, like every kid hits the ball, goes to first base. One of first goes to second, second to third. It's always bases loaded. And, you know, they just move up one at a time. (laughs) And there were kids coming up with bases empty, like at the bottom of the lineup. I was like, our kids were this this one little girl on our team she was turning double plays it was it was fun that's fantastic um, yeah so anyways that's my little side story of you know yeah that's that's kind of the world that we live in right now of like we can't have anybody be you know and uh and i think we kind of see that with the winners and losers in the monetary system you know of like you can't let a business fail you know like you had the bailouts. You can't let a bank fail. Like they ran themselves poorly, but they still get a participation trophy. You can't let them be losers at the end of the day. It, it boggled my mind back when that happened. And I, um, I took a look at that and I'm going, you do know that another entity will come and pick up those assets and run it better. Don't you? Or do you understand that those assets, they're still there. They just need to be managed by another entity because the, the people that failed or the people that over leveraged or whatever they did there, they don't deserve to continue to manage other people's assets because of what they did. Uh, You know, and I take a look back at the, the GM in, in uh, uh, Chrysler fiasco, you know, Mm -hmm. why in the world when you knew that there are other automotive companies that could come in and retool and restructure and build a better Detroit or build a better, you know, yeah, yeah, I forget where the court, uh, you know, some of the plants are, you know, there's some in New Hampshire, obviously there's a lot of them around the country and yeah, there's going to be a, a temporary shortage of work, but if you can find a manufacturer that's going to come in and, run the shop 
maybe the jobs aren't going to pay as much. Well, well, guess what? If if you're building cars and you're making 40 or $45 an hour and the cars either aren't selling or aren't lasting, well, then it's time to renegotiate either your contract in quotes or how much, you know, line workers should make. And I'm I'm not saying that they don't deserve a good wage or, because that's that's hard tedious just boring work sometimes because you got to finish your job in one minute and then the next car comes along the line and you know you do the same work and you do that for 8 hours. You know, but the thing is that the the workers and the employees and the management have to work together to create a product that's going to be profitable for the stockholders. And if you don't, well then guess what? You know, there's no 30 year pension anymore. You know, you've got to stay competitive. It's not big three anymore. You got however many uh, international companies that are competing with you as well. And you got, you got, you got to make hay while the sun shines. And if you don't, well, then you're going to end up working for somebody that is, that's just the way it is. And and it's the way it should be, because that's the only way that innovation actually increases. Because if there's no competition, then why would you innovate? You know, and if, if you're innovating alongside of a competitor, one of those innovations is going to win. And the other one is going to have to get off first base and head to the bench. Yeah, there you go, man. That's what a, what a connection there. And somehow, somehow we turned winning and losing going from the constitution, winning and losing to T-ball to financial bailouts in the car industry back to that. That was quite the journey. It's uh, that was a, like a, a good double play there. You know, like I, I was a second baseman tossing it to you, the shortstop, you, you know, did the quick sidestep and, and threw it on to first. Um, so I got to um, ask you then out in Michigan, um, does that mean you're a Red Wings fan? Um, I'm actually closer to, uh, I'll, I'll slightly dox myself, but most people know this anyway. I live in Southwest Michigan, uh, which is actually nearer to Chicago than it is to Detroit. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I grew up a Red Wings fan uh, and uh, I was born and raised uh, as a Michigan state fan in the, in the center of the state. Uh, so I was initially a Red Wings fan, but the more and more people I get around in Chicago, it's like, I kind of follow both teams. And, but you know, I, if I'm going to root for one, I'm going to root for the Red Wings, but I'm going to say this, the Chicago Blackhawks have the best looking sweaters in all of the NHL. I do agree. They do. Their red, their red sweater is, is incredible. Yeah. Um, I'm a, I'm a Penguins fan. So, uh, you know, we, we had the, uh, 08, 09 back to back with, mm-hmm. uh, you and the Red Wings. Uh, so that was, uh, some classic battles. Uh, but yeah, I had the, as soon as I found out you were in Michigan, I'm like, well, he, he you're so Kalamazoo out there. Cause my, I have cousins that live in Chicago and then, um, I went, uh, you mentioned Michigan state, but I'm actually a Michigan football fan, uh, Wolverines in, um, and I'll I went on my call. I went on my, what'd you say? I'll pray for you. Oh uh, yeah. Well, we all, we need it. We need as much as oh. we can get. Um, I, I, I proudly was in Columbus, Ohio recently wearing nothing but Michigan gear, just walking around. Like, wow. You're alive. Congratulations. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, Michigan, uh, we were, I was doing my college visit there and then we stayed in a hotel near on my way out to my cousin's wedding in like Kalamazoo or something. And, uh, and my mom really wanted to go to the, uh, the Kellogg's factory. Oh, that's Bell Creek. Bell Creek. Yep. Yeah. And she like really, really was trying to sell all of us kids on it and nobody was biting. Nobody was biting on going to the Kellogg's factory. So she got this, we always joke about it. She got this pamphlet from the lobby to try and like sell it to us. And she was reading and her selling line was, you can come in and watch how it goes from the field to the flake. And we were like, it's not making the argument you think it is, mom. (laughs) This is the making of a politician or wait a minute. I said that out loud. I'm sorry. Um, Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, I did take a tour uh, when I was a kid and you know what? They actually stopped those tours a number of years ago. I think before we actually moved from you know, the MSU area down here. Uh, so you might not have even gotten that tour to be honest. Oh with you. man. Um, and, uh, and so w- I also, this is a funny side note with the um, podcast and your channel. If you go on YouTube right now, and search Bitcoin made simple. It's not, it's nothing but you videos that pop up. Is it really? Yeah. It's so funny. I'm not uh, like 
I'm not jealous or mad or anything because I'm like, you know, my YouTube channel has like a hundred subscribers or something, and I'm mainly doing the podcast. I just I record the video and put it on YouTube because there's some people obviously that that prefer to watch it that way. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's so funny if you go on. I was like, I need to figure out my keywords because I'm literally called the Bitcoin Made Simple Podcast, and you search Bitcoin Made Simple, and I don't even think I show up on the page. Like it's uh, it's very so. Do you have any magic to the YouTube algorithm or understand how that works? I have nothing to do with the YouTube algorithm when it comes to ninety nine bitcoins. And if I did, I think I'd have to shoot you if I told you. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> but obviously, you know, we want to see everybody in this space succeed because the more education that we can do to people that are outside of the Bitcoin community, the better everybody's going to be for it. Uh, but yeah, I, it's funny that you mentioned that because I was actually on um, a space earlier this week and we were talking about uh, Bitcoin in, in Lebanon and actually, you know, that economy and how it's, it's um, really struggling and how to actually have Bitcoin be, you know, implemented in that country. And I took a look at Bitcoin and I'm just, I'm, I'm typing on my computer as I'm on my, on my phone on the space and I put Bitcoin in Lebanon and there's this website, bitcoinslebanon.com. And one of their subheadings was, you know, Bitcoin wh- or what is Bitcoin? I clicked on that and there's just this big billboard size of me with the what is Bitcoin video, which now has what, four and a half million views over the last three years. And it's like, oh, wow, people are just taking that video and making it their introduction to what Bitcoin is. And it's amazing how you know, did I ever imagine five years ago that I would be the 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 face and voice of of Bitcoin for a lot of people? I would never have have known that. Uh, I'm glad that, and I take I take that as a responsibility because it it's been dropped in my lap. It was something that I didn't create, but it's something that one makes sense, two is beneficial for anybody who gets involved, uh, and so. To have that responsibility of being that face and that voice and and recognizing that there are more and more people that are being pointed to me and those videos because of it, that's that's a weight that I take on. I take it on gladly because I do think it's that important within the next 10, 20, 30 years for more and more people to know about Bitcoin so that the transition into what's going to really be a new monetary system is a lot smoother for more people. Yeah. Yeah. And um, do you get, do you get recognized out in public? It's funny. The first time I got recognized, I was in uh, it was during COVID, but they were finally letting people back into the casinos. And I play five dollar blackjack because I was in the casino industry, so you know you, you kind yeah. of enjoy the banter more oh, than yeah. about the game. And so I'm playing five dollar blackjack. I've got a mask on, um, and uh, I got a player's card, so I gave my license to the to the pit to the pit manager. He gave me that back along with the player's card. And uh, after I was done playing, I'd cashed, you know, I'd, I'd checked up. Uh, he said, hey, hey, you have a YouTube channel like Bitcoins or something like that. And it's like, I'm still wearing a mask, but he got it off of my off my driver's license picture that he recognized me. And it's like, huh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he started asking me <laughs> questions right there. And I'm like, and so it begins. And yeah. that was, you know, that was a while ago. But yeah, I, I do get recognized. But you know, I'm fortunate to live where I live because I don't have a whole lot of foot traffic or people that I cross paths with that go, hey, that's that guy. Uh, it's happening more often. And, you know, my wife w- was just mentioning to me as we're at um, one of the county fairs here that more and more people are actually beginning to recognize me. And that's, yeah, it's something that we're going to have to manage now. And it's like, that's something totally foreign to me. But yeah. you know, I'll just have to deal with it the way I can. And, you know, and, and hopefully I can just represent myself well and represent what we're trying to accomplish here well as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm, you know, I was reluctant, you know, with my background and uh, I like to be behind the camera. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I was very reluctant, but I just felt like I needed to learn more about Bitcoin. And by doing that uh, it was to, to interview the, you know, the best minds in the space and the people that knew it better than, than, uh, than the rest of us. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's a reluctantly stepped out into it. Um, do you have any funny, any fun, uh, casino stories before we go? Anything interesting that happened over the years that you can uh, divulge? 
I have, I have a few, some of them are a little colorful and I will, That's all right. <laughs> I will share one that is a little bit colorful. Uh, it, I was dealing, uh, dealing craps at the time and we got a full, uh, full table. It's Friday or Saturday night. And we, we, the, the casino was close enough to Notre Dame university to the point where we get a lot of people that come out, you know, after the football games or what have you. Mm -hmm. And we had the stereotypical frat boys come in and they were already kind of, you know, pre pre lubed as we call it. They'd already been drinking by the time they walked into the casino and they're loud and obnoxious like they can sometimes get. And there's three or four of them. I'm, I'm, I'm dealing on base, which is the guy that's actually holding the chips, not the guy with the stick in his hand that, that, that mm -hmm. retrieves the, the, uh, the, uh, the dice. And this guy's just throwing, I don't know if you're familiar with, or anybody's familiar with, with, uh, the craps table, but you can bet on what's the hard ways. You know, if, if the two dice come up, uh, a two, two, that's a hard four as opposed to a one, three, which is, is an easy four because there's two different ways on two dice to get a three and a one or a one and a three to get a four. So the hard ways, uh, the two, two. And so this guy's just throwing in, give me a hard four, give me a hard eight, give me a hard this. And, uh, and, uh, so we're either setting up his bets and somebody rolls the dice and Stickman calls out four hard four. And one of the guys just jumps almost out of his, out of his pants and, and just goes, yes, yes, I have a hard four. And I just stood up and looked at him and said, sir, that's not generally something that you brag about. <laughs> and everybody at the whole table just broke out laughing because it was just that kind of quick wit that I've developed. And it's, it's a curse as much as it is a blessing because it was just something that popped out of, you know, just came out and oh and, i have that same curse you know uh, <laughs> i'm sure your wife and my wife could sit there and have a conversation about the the you know she goes like you need to work on your filter like sometimes there's yeah. certain things that shouldn't come out you know that's about <laughs> as far as my filter will allow me to actually go but the 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 timing of that i just i i couldn't resist i had to go after that one and that was probably one of the funnier ones that i had i had one guy uh, I'll tell you one more, and this isn't nearly as colorful, but I had one guy that came in and he always brought like this whistle or kazoo with him. And he just, you know, a guy that liked to be the center of attention and he played blackjack. And I was, um, I was actually pit manager that, that day. So I'm standing behind the table and, and, uh, he, I'm dealing cards and, and this guy's name was Bill and, uh, he was being obnoxious. And, uh, I said, Bill, you know, you gotta be careful with me because I'm a professional smart ass. I do this for a living. And uh, he said, well, Nate, you know, yeah, you're going to have to work up your game because I, because I practice and I practice and I practice. So that's great, Bill, but you still got no talent. And the whole table just busted out. I've never seen anybody just kind of turn into a turtle into his turtleneck. And it was the best hour of silence from him that I think I can ever remember uh, hearing. So, you know, I, it's just, it's. And I don't, I don't like, that's more my shtick than anything else. Cause if, if you've heard, you know, during even this conversation, it's like, I, I'm kind of a, a gentle guy. I really don't like being that, that like rough around the, yeah, you don't like, yeah, me. I really don't. Is in fact, the, the year that I've been out of the casino, it's like, I've lost some of that wit and I'm not, I'm not upset about that. You know, yeah. it's like, you know, yeah, I've got the stories. And they're kind of funny to tell, but it's like, I'm, I'm really, you can get pretty jaded and just kind of start popping off at the mouth and you can get yourself in trouble. I have no idea how I got away with some of the things that I actually said to some of my players, because, you know, people will be talking or complaining. I'd, I'd turn to another player and go, he's still talking. Is he still talking? <laughs> Trash talking right there. Oh, yeah, I am. Um, I'm, I was horrible. I was horrible. And it, it's, it, it's funny. Uh, I'll let you run here in a second, but the, I know that, thinking about the interesting perspective while you're learning and going down the Bitcoin rabbit hole and how valuable, you know, your time and your money is, what was it like to sit there and watch? Cause I've always wondered in a casino, what's it like for the dealers? You know, do you feel bad whenever you beat everybody at the table, you know, as a blackjack dealer, that would depend on the player. Uh, because, uh, because there are the personalities that you just, you, you, you hate when they win because you just, these people are nasty. They're horrible. So I don't want them to win. And so it's hard to hold back the smug smile when they've actually busted and they leave angrily because it's like, I really didn't want you here anyway. Yeah. Uh, there are some people that, uh, that you know, like, like, like me, I just kind of like go enjoy the banter between the players and the dealer. 
And, you know, uh, by the way, if you're a casino player and you go and play any live games, I'll say this, tip your dealers, tip your dealers, mm-hmm. because they're a tipped employee, at least in the United States. Uh, and they do horrible work with people that turn horrible because they're drinking and playing with their money at the same time. So I'll just put that plug in for dealers. If, if you play table games at all, and here's my rule, uh, if uh, end of the shoe, dollar, you know, dollar for the crew. Because if you talk, if everybody tosses them a buck, that that makes them a decent li- at the end of every shoe, which is about fifteen minutes. That's a, that's a decent living. So thank thank you for letting me plug the dealers because that's hard work. It's hard work, and you can get jaded, and you can you can lose your cool, and it's 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 harder than what it looks. It's not the glamour job that everybody makes it out to be. Yeah, it can't be easy to just sit there and watch people lose money and lose money and lose money, yeah. and not become jaded. Um, you know, and uh, yeah, it's funny that you, you mentioned the five dollar blackjack because that's I used to play cards a lot more, um, but uh, you know, this like that was in my younger days. Um, and uh, but my brother, my my sister was getting married in June, and we went took my brother in law to a casino, my you know for his bachelor party, and uh, he's like the cheapest guy in the world. <laughs> and I I told him to sit down and um, play blackjack, and he was like sweating five dollar hands like after like five hands he turns around and he goes and he stands up with his chips and he goes, i was like what are you doing and he was like uh i'm done i'm up five bucks so i'm done and i was like what you know you you play you sit you gotta sit and play you know this and he's like no i'm up five bucks i was like okay so then i sat down in his chair and we didn't miss a beat and i literally doubled my money and i was like all you had to do was i mean i did it within like 20 minutes you know i mean it was a lucky run but like you know i know i'm smart enough to know and i've done it enough where if you sit down and within 20 to 30 minutes you double your money at the blackjack table probably walk away because it's gonna turn south real quick um so yeah i i but uh I'm that sure is the ultimate, by of- the way that is the ultimate in shit coining right there you know you got somebody that wants to protect their money then you go and sit down you make your bundle and you're like you know what you should have bought this you should have got that you yeah know? that's true <laughs> casinos are shit coins they are shit coins <laughs> uh well nate i appreciate you coming on and uh we'll have to do this again and and uh maybe i can get myself up the bitcoin algorithm by the next time and and uh i'll be a rival okay i won't be a rival so don't worry i'm not competition for you i look forward to seeing one of your shows above the what is bitcoin uh video because that would be that would be great i've really enjoyed the conversation thanks for having me on uh i hope you don't mind if i kind of plug my show a little bit no here. i was just gonna say before we sign off uh, where can people find you Uh, They can find me obviously on 99bitcoins.com with the seven day crash course. I've just begun uh, a a podcast of my own, uh, which is going to be called Why Bitcoin. And it's going to be uh, similar in stature to, I think, what you do. And we'll be talking to people about uh, why Bitcoin is necessary, profitable. Uh, we'll talk. We'll talk some beginner stuff too, as far as you know, storage and spending, and and how to get involved with Bitcoin and not not get yourself hurt. So that's going to be called Why Bitcoin. Right now, it's called the Nate Martin Show because I really didn't know what else to call it. Uh, but the first episode started the week of the uh, 1971 thing, and I'm looking forward to doing some more of that. So 99bitcoins.com. You can uh, you can find me at. Uh, at Nate Martin 99B on Twitter, and I'm on Twitter Spaces regularly, and I am Nate Martin One on Clubhouse. Yeah, I also have Nate Martin One on Twitter, but it's like I don't use that one anymore because I'm pretty much all Bitcoin stuff when I when I do stuff. So uh, I I know I rattled on about that, but uh, no, no, the, yeah, yeah um, those are places you can find me. And uh, and obviously, you know, if you just Google what is Bitcoin, you'll find Nate and, uh, and you'll see my face with a bad haircut. And I look much better now than I did when I made that video. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, you're being bashful. You're being, you're being too modest. You know, what's uh, funny. I watched that. I watched that video and that was like in my first one or two years of actually doing spokesperson stuff. I watched that video and I go, gosh, that's so horrible. And because <laughs> I've been on camera so much more now, I'm so much more comfortable with it. I'm like, this is, but that's, that's the growing process. And if, if it's done the job that it's done, I shouldn't really complain about it. But I, I tell you what, when you when you take a look back at some of the work that you've done previously, you go, oh, wow, did I really look like that? It, it's just, it's it's humorous. 
Well, I got to ask them before we, we, before we wrap up, what, what else did you, uh, have you been a spokesperson for? Like, what are you currently, you know, do you do other stuff? Obviously you don't do shit coins or anything, but like, I don't any- do anything else anymore as far as being a spokesperson for, because of the exclusivity agreement that, that Ophir and I have, because we wanted to protect both my and his brand. And because I'm reckon now we have over 500,000 subscribers. So it's like people That's are actually crazy. trying to hunt me down on Fiverr and go, oh, I know this guy. He's actually going to help us out. Well, it's sort of like me and 99 Bitcoins endorsing whatever product they're, they're trying to get me for 20 bucks for. And I'm like, no, that's not going to happen. So we're just going to take that profile right off of Fiverr and not worry about it anymore. And uh, it's just, it, it protects us both uh, that way anyway. So I don't do that. Um, but I did, uh, there was one company where I was doing like roofing and construction companies and I was sort of a subcontractor. What They were kind of a social media um, uh marketing agency and they used me for some of their clients. And so, you know, uh, siding and roofing companies and stuff like that. I, I know I did a, uh, um, a software and computer store in Toronto, uh, a while back, you know, just, it's, it really was a matter of just being the spokesperson. I'll shoot you a script and you put it on a green screen and we'll put, you know, we'll just put whatever we need to on there. And, you know, it was a great way to get started with, with micro gigging and, you know, I actually got started trying to do the the testimonials in quotes. And that was that point in time when when fake testimonials weren't really being regulated very well. Mm-hmm. I did one, felt nauseous about it because it's like, no, nah, this just doesn't feel right. And I said, now nah, we'll just do the spokesperson stuff and see what happens. So yeah, that was just a dirty way to get involved in it. And I chose to not do that. And it was it was a better choice, believe me. Yeah. Well, uh, I wish you all the success and uh, I'm sure we'll see each other on spaces more too here because we I've, I've noticed you bouncing into ones that usually I get in later, you know, after the kids and wife go to bed and um, you know, that's my, my calm time. It doesn't sound calm because sometimes I can get a little riled up, but you know. Yeah, no, I can't watch movies anymore. So generally speaking, my wife will go up and watch uh, a couple of episodes of whatever and I'll come down and, and I'll be on uh, Twitter spaces or clubhouse and then I have to realize, you know what? If I don't spend any time with my wife, that's going to cause an issue. And I don't want those issues. You know, I've been married uh, quite some time. And, I, you know, it, that relationship has uh, flourished well. And I am not going to risk any part of it. Thank you very much. No, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a garden and you have to tend to it, you know. You do. Um, you do. So. And I have a lovely wife. I've been married. I'm not ashamed to say it. I've been married for 36 years, which speaks to one thing and one thing alone. And that is that I'm one hell of a salesman. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. She's a great, she's a great partner and we've lived a wonderful life together. So, and we look forward to just that much more. Oh, I say that all the time. I'm like, I, I outkicked my coverage uh, to do a football, <laughs> the football reference. Right. Um, you know, where I'm just like, wow, like really me, like people like, look, Oh, wow. That's interesting. She's uh, much better way out of your league. I'm like, yeah, she definitely is. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Maybe it was all that wit and humor. Who knows? <laughs> <But I'm> not, <laughs> we'll go with that. Yeah, we'll I'm not complaining. That. So, all right. Well, thanks for coming on, Nate. It's been my pleasure. I would look forward to doing it again. 